Welcome to uh, the first Sunday of a new year. This is uh, exciting that uh, Pat and I can be with you for this very special day. We want to thank you. Uh, thank you from the bottom of our hearts for all the love that you uh, always give us this past week. Uh, there's so many of you who have had us uh, over to your home, be able to sit in your house, to be able to uh, have meals with you and talk. And, and just pray together. Uh, it is wonderful. Uh, I don't know how a missionary could be loved more than Twickenham loves us. And truly, from the bottom of my heart, it is a high point to get to be here. And it is for Pat. And we want to thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the worship. Our, our, our cups are are filled and running over. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Well, you know, I was talking last night to some people about today, and when we uh, come to Huntsville from Oklahoma, uh, people say, well, now, aren't you a little bit intimidated to go over there? There's, there's people that's really smart in Alabama because we played them football, and they have plays that's different. <laughs> um, and I say, yeah, we, we go to Huntsville. Uh, it's a home of NASA, and there's a lot of smart people. And when I go over there, man, I get really anxious about it. But then I always remember that when I went to school, we learned higher math in Centerview High School, Centerview Grade School. It's not just two plus two over there. They really get in higher math. And I know some of you guys really study high math, being engineers and all. But we studied Kazunta math. Uh, we, we studied it real hard. And it's, it's different from trigonometry. And it is just so enlightening to us Okies. We learned how two goes into four, two goes into six, <laughs> two goes into ten. And so I don't feel intimidated being here because I know Kazunta math. <laughs> I want to talk to you this morning about something very quick. I want to talk about the power, a power and quagmire. Uh, this is a story of the Bible, the Babel story from Genesis, the 11th chapter. I want to read that text to you to get started. Uh, it is a, a very interesting story, and I think we'll find some interesting things for it today. Um, one time, all the people in the world spoke the same language, and they used the same words. And as the people migrated to the east, they found a plain in the land, or the plain of Babylonia, and they settled there. Now they began to say to each other, let's, let's make bricks and harden them with fire. Uh, in this region, bricks were used instead of stone, and tar was used for mortar. And they said, come, let's, let's build a great city for ourselves and a tower that reaches to the sky. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. But the Lord came down to look at the city and the tower and the people that the people were building, and they said, look, the people are united, and they all speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down and confuse the people with different languages. Then they won't be able to understand each other. In that way, the Lord scattered them all over the world, and they stopped building the city. That's why the city was called Babel, because that's where the Lord confused the people with different languages. In this way, he scattered them all over the world. I just want to talk about this. This is very close to my heart. And uh, if you ever try to learn a foreign language, it will be to you as well. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is the tower. Then they said, come, 
let's build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. So what's wrong with building a tower? I was reading the other day, uh, back a hundred years ago, around the turn of the century, the tallest structure on the face of this earth was the Eiffel Tower. Uh, Today it's still a beautiful, beautiful structure. The problem with them building a tower was that it wasn't God's plan. They wanted to do it themselves. They had in their hearts to do something great for themselves. God had told them to go all through the world and and have children and, and populate the whole world. They weren't to stay together. They sure weren't to, to be there forever and make a name for themselves. It wasn't God's plan. Look at the power that we see in this passage. It's really interesting to me. Look, he said, the people are united and they all speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. There's great power when people unite as one in any endeavor, whether it's wartime or peace. If people work together and are united, there's a lot of power in that. And God knew that. God, our Creator, knows very well because He created us. And when we all get together, He realizes there's a lot of power in that. Now, I'm going to blow your mind because I'm going to jump in the New Testament. This is how my mind works. It's kind of weird. But I see how Jesus talks about we should deny ourselves Take up our cross and follow Him. The whole idea there is that He is the leader of our lives. We're not the leader of our lives, but it's Jesus that leads our lives. He is the one to follow. He wants us to be united in Him. And so that's just a simple thing. I think that we can see from this Babel story, and that is that there's a lot of power that we can tap into if we're united, if we put Jesus first. There's a lot of power, tremendous power. And then I want to notice the quagmire of this story, this Babel story. God said, let's go down and confuse the people with different languages. Then they won't be able to understand each other. Um, Pat and I think there's a lot more than just changing the language that's involved in this. The culture is changed when the language is changed. We were so, I, I don't know what the word would be when we went to Ecuador we just thought we'll go and nail the language we'll go down there and do this mission Um, it didn't happen that way folks there's much much more to it than what we realized what we were ready for so we were uh, just not ready for people to, to act the way that Latin people act and think let me give you a little bit of an example. You, you go out and talk to some employees and tell them to do a task, and it's just the opposite when it's completed. Just the I mean, totally opposite. You can drive down the road, and when people want to turn left, what do they do? They go to the right, and they put their right blinker on, and they sit there, with the right blinker on, going to turn left. It takes a while for me to get used to all that. There are just hundreds and thousands and millions of ways that our minds are just the opposite. And so Pat and I really believe there's, there's a lot more what the Lord did than just change the languages. There's a, there's a cultural difference And at the end of the day, when it's all said, the bottom line is confusion. 
And I feel this so much in my life. We get uh, so frustrated because of things that are simple, that should be simple, that wind up being hard. Confusion. One of man's greatest needs, in my opinion, is to have peace. When you have peace and you can wake up in the morning and you feel good about your life and everything is, is there for you to do, you have peace, you have comfort. You know what the Old Testament tells you? That God is the only one that can bring contentment to a man's life. Only God can do that. And if you're content in what you do, praise God for that. It's not easy. And it wasn't easy for these people when they woke up one morning. Can you imagine going to build the Tower of Babel and you walk in and everybody's talking a language that you don't understand? It must have been an eye-opener. And I'm sure that there was a lot of people scratching their heads and wondering what to do. And finally, being able to talk to somebody, they get together and say, what's wrong with those people over there? They must be from Oklahoma or something like that. And wound up, they just couldn't live with each other. It was just too different. It was too hard. And so they scattered all over the world, just like God wanted them to do. Well, I think there's some real practical things that we can talk about when we look at this whole story, when we talk about the Aussie end of hope. HOH um, started... Um, actually 11 years ago this week. Did you know that? And I have said all these years, uh, every time you see me, I say this is God's project. It's not my project. It's not Twickenham's project per se. It's God's project. It's not a tower that we want to build. It is God's project. I know that, and this morning in Bible class, I talked about why I know that. There's a lot of evidence to show you that, and if I had time, I would talk about all of those things. But His power is made strong when I'm weak. And I've learned that. I've learned it through the years. Pat's learned that. His power is strongest when we are weak. Now when we're united as a group, when we're united as brothers and sisters in Christ, and we deny ourselves and sacrifice and work as one person, there is a great power for huge accomplishments. And if you don't believe me, you need to come to Ecuador and see what God has done. It is phenomenal. It is absolutely phenomenal. Ten years in Ecuador. Eleven years ago, we came here and started our business plan. We started working out the details of how it's going to look and what we're going to do, what the logo is going to be, what the name is going to be. And then 10 years ago this week, we moved to Ecuador and we started. We started with two employees. One of them still works for us. And then we began to see all the challenges that we were up against and all the ways that Satan throws monkey wrenches at you and tries to confuse you. Let's praise God for all that he has done through all of us working together. And I want to invite every person in this auditorium and, and take this seriously because I am serious as I can be about this. Each one is invited to be at, at Pat and I's home for the last weekend in March. We'll have the uh, first Hacienda completely done all four houses, the two apartments, the, the garden area in the center, everything's going to be done. And when you look back and see all that we all have done together, 
all the, the ways that God has used individuals, all of us together, we should take a time, a weekend, and just praise Him. We're going to have good food. I've got a couple of hogs that's uh, slotted out there to butcher. We've got some people lined up to come and and demonstrate native dancing in front of you and sing the native Quechuan song. We're going to praise God for two days and thank Him for all that He has done in establishing a home and a beautiful place for young people to be discipled. Now that's going to be a great, a great weekend, and I really want every one of you to come. Well, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the most important thing that's happened with the Ascend of Hope, and that is the lives that God has brought to us. This first uh, picture is of Jorge. He was our first child. Jorge was on the streets of Tabacundo. He only had a little pair of jeans and a little shirt. His hair was down past his uh, shoulders. He had no name. And he told me that he kind of liked everybody calling him George, Jorge. And so that became his name. He had 17 brothers and sisters. And there's, uh, at that point, there was even more that was born later. He lived in a little shack. You could see through the walls, just boards, and a sheet iron roof that was rusted. And when I went to go across the way to pick up a belt and another pair of jeans that had holes in them, I had to wade through the mud, similar to a hog pen. I was afraid it was going to go over my boot tops. That was where he lived. But he wasn't fed there. He fed himself out of garbage cans along the street. Jorge had something that I'll never forget, and that was a smile that was a million dollars. Today, Jorge comes to our house every day he and Pat have a thing going. We have a, a night uh, school. We're renting the school out at night to try to generate some extra income. And there's a snack bar there where uh, these men that are learning to drive a vehicle are, are going to school there at nights. And he runs a snack bar for us. They sell hamburgers and hot dogs and french fries. And Jorge, we bought a nice a nice cash register, and he runs a cash register. And he, he uh, coordinates that with Pat. She gets all the change ready and counts it and does the record keeping, and Jorge comes and brings, uh, he gets the cash, goes down and comes back afterwards and tells us what happened. And uh, more times than not, he's not off one penny, not one cent. Um, you look back, you think about if God hadn't been a part of his life, what would he be doing each day instead of what he's doing today? That's a beautiful story. I'm sorry, I can't help but get emotional. Our next little boy is um, new to us. His name is Maximilian or Max. He is uh, such a precious little boy. He's got a smile like that all the time. And he's so loving, he'll just come up and grab you and squeeze you every time you see him. This summer, Max came to us from Guayaquil. And although I didn't get to go there, I sent, sent someone as my representative to check it out for a few days like I usually do. He called back and said, uh, this is a case we really need to act on. And it was real similar to Jorge's case. They lived in a little box of a house 
that was about seven uh, square meters, uh, just very, very, very small. And there was four children and a mother, and there was no food. Max came to us in that situation with his brother and sister. And we're very, very glad that God brought him to us. Our next little girl is uh, familiar to some of you. Magali came to us uh, a couple of years ago. Um, her mother had a house uh, with full of kids, and she had to make a decision because she wasn't able to feed them, and she knew that her husband had been killed. And she heard about us, and she came and asked us if we would please consider taking one of her children so that the rest could live. And Pat and I went by there, and we went back, and we went back um, four different days, and Magali came to live with us. And she is the sweetest little girl. She's so intelligent, and she uh, will do anything that you ask her to do. She just loves to work. Next, uh, next little girl is Maria Beatriz, and Maria was living under a bridge. Uh, she was uh, living off the street, and there's there's so much more I can tell about all these these kids. But Maria Beatriz is very intelligent, and she's just as sweet as she seems in the picture. She always comes up and hugs you. There isn't anything she wouldn't do to help, and she's so grateful so grateful for every meal that she gets because she was eating hog feed before she came to us. Next little boy is Adan. Now Adan, if you've been to Ecuador, you've met Adan and you realize he enjoys every single meal to its fullest. <laughs> He's a chunk. He's so sweet. But he really loves to eat, and he's growing, and he's healthy. When we got him, um, we kept him in our home, Pat and I did, and um, this is a gross story, but he was throwing up worms that were about as long as a pencil and about the same size diameter. His stomach was all pooched out, and he had been living in the, off the garbage cans. But today... He is a healthy young man, and he's growing like crazy. Our next child uh, is Carmen. Carmen is uh, very quiet. She's very sweet, and uh, she's learning so much. Every, every day at school, uh, Pat taught her for the first few uh, months of her life, and got her kind of a quick start or a kick start in life and um, she's very very uh, close to Pat's heart uh, next child is Anthony and Anthony is very sensitive he uh, he just loves people when he was being uh, analyzed by a psychologist before we received him they put him in a room with several other kids and uh, they brought in a, a package of cookies that would be equal to one for every child in the room and they had a makeup game that that he would win they knew that before they went in and so when they gave him the bag of cookies and they wanted to see what he would do he got up from his little chair and went around the room and gave everybody a cookie. He didn't count them first. He gave everybody in the room one, and there was one left for him. And that typifies his personality. He, uh, he lives for others. Next child is Jenny. She's new this summer. She's the oldest of the, of the three children that we, we got from the coast this summer. Jenny is as sweet as she can be. She'll work hard. She never complains. She wants to do her part, and she realizes how much of a blessing it is to have a home and a bed to sleep in at night. Next child is uh, Gladys, and Gladys is a little mischievous, 
if you've been to Ecuador, you know what I'm talking about. But she has a big heart. She can't help but have a big heart, uh, even as mischievous as she is. Next child is a very uh, sweet little boy. Uh, Matthew um, is also quiet, and he comes across quiet. But he is very loving to all of his brothers and sisters, and it wouldn't be anything for him to, to do whatever is needed in the house. He regularly takes out the trash for their house. He's a, he's a good little boy. Uh, next uh, child is Maria, and Maria has a quiet temperament, but her eyes say it all. She uh, just looks at you, and you can see all the love in her eyes. I've said this to Marla before. I think she reminds me of Marla Logan in, in her sweetness and being the kind of girl she is, but yet she can be mischievous at times. <laughs> the next little boy is very quiet. Uh, he is uh, uh, Luis. He... Um, He's very introverted in his personality, but once you get to know him, he's just as sweet as he can be, and he always greets you with a hug. Our next little girl is uh, very special to anybody that's been to Ecuador because she's so sweet, and that's Diana. Diana's mother died right after she came to us, but our mother knew she was going to die, and she wanted us to care for her. Um, she has always been... A helper. She greets you with a smile and a hug. The next uh, little boy is uh, our new little boy that came this summer, Sebastian, and uh, he's a little mischievous. We, uh, we were worried about him at first, but he is a, a very good-hearted boy, and he's very glad to have a roof over his head and three squares a day. The next uh, child is Cynthia, She's getting into that teenage years where everything has to be just right and uh, her hair has to be right, but she wants to work. She has in her savings uh, about $300 now because uh, they work for Pops in the summertime and uh, she's a hard worker when she wants to be. And, uh, but more importantly, she's a saver. She doesn't spend her money. She wants to, to be... Uh, kept safe. Uh, the next uh, little uh, boy is Fabian. He was uh, starved as a child. His mother literally tried to starve him to death, but he made it through it. They told us that he was uh, mentally unbalanced and couldn't be helped and he couldn't learn. We found out just the opposite. He is very intelligent and he is a, a worker. And uh, even though he's a little mischievous, he has a good heart. Uh, the next one is uh, Kathy. Uh, Kathleen was baptized, like Glenn said, when he was there. She is uh, very serious about her servantship, her serv service to the Lord, and being uh, a, 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 on the pathway to heaven. She's um, very uh, sweet very sincere and, and very honest. John is uh, a little mischievous at times. Uh, he is uh, very helpful to his brothers and sisters, and uh, everybody looks up to John because he's getting taller all the time. He's going to be our tallest boy, I believe. Our next uh, girl is very uh, special to all of us because she's been the mother to so many in our house, Leonella is uh, now 16 and uh, she has one ambition in life and that is to find a good man to marry and have a good home with lots of good kids that believe in the Lord. He'll tell you that. Uh, our last picture is of Christian. Christian is a strong leader uh, not only to his brothers but to his home. He's a leader at school, but most importantly, he's a leader at church. He uh, oftentimes, uh, more than not, leads the singing. He loves to sing. If you uh, pull up his uh, 
Facebook site, you'll probably see him doing some songs on there. He loves to be a part of, of what all is going on. He always has a smile and a hug and is serious about life. Next picture is a girl's house, and uh, that's the house parents Fabricio and Estella. The next picture is a boy's house, and uh, that's um, Mr. Jorge and Miss Fabi. Um, the last picture in the lesson will be yours, um, is, is a picture of what you will see if you come to Ecuador in March. These kids want to have you there. They love having Americans. They'll all talk to you in English, and you'll be able to understand them. They uh, want you to come, and they uh, have a desire to know you. And when you go to uh, Ecuador on mission or with any group, you're going to find that they'll spend time with you, and you'll get to know them. And so I invite all of you to please consider coming now, I'm going to give you a little technical details here. This week, uh, the last week in March, we're going to give you two options because it's two hours to the airport, and I need to make some plans. I need to get a bus lined up to come and get you and bring you back. And so we're going to give you two options. One would be option A, to uh, come on Wednesday and stay through till the following Wednesday. In that option, you'll do a little work, you'll have time to be in the dedication, and then after the dedication, uh, Pat and I promise to show you around the area at some of the beautiful haciendas that's uh, several hundred years old. So that's option A. Option B is for the rest of you who are so busy you can't come but just a quick trip over the weekend, and that would be arriving on Thursday and going back on Sunday, Sunday night. And so um, keep those things in mind. Please be praying about them and, uh, and get with Steve Owens or any, admission, uh, any member of the missions committee uh, for more information. We love each and every one of you because you love us so much. And I'm sorry, I'd, I'd love to get to know every one of you that I don't know here today. So uh, please come, come up and talk to Pat and I and... Uh, Maybe next time we come, we can get to know you better. God bless you. Thank you. I invite our shepherds and uh, our missions committee to come up as, as we pray over Jerry. And while they're making their way up, i got two quick announcements. One, we've been invited to come to the Ferris Drive Gospel Meeting this week. And it's Wednesday through Friday at 7 o'clock. And I'll be speaking on Friday night. Uh, if you come, you'll get credit for four Wednesday night attendances here. So anyway, if you'd like to come. Uh, also, uh, a year, two years ago in January, we started a five-month um, meeting, and we were getting together as a congregation going through our journey series, and we talked about core beliefs and core values. The next four Sundays, next four Sundays, we're going to be meeting as a congregation and we're going to be talking about our next steps, and that's going to be unveiling our, our purpose statement as a congregation. I'm going to encourage everyone to do three things. One is to pray for these efforts, and then also to come and to join us for our worship time. And then finally, we're going to be doing a lot of the nuts and bolts in our class times. So if you're not a part of one of our adult Bible fellowships, please give Lincoln, Steve, or I a call, and we'll get you plugged into one. But it's an important time for our congregation, so I'm going to ask us to all commit to coming for the next four weeks as we unveil this next step. Let's pray together for Jerry. And Jerry, I appreciate you and Pat and all your work. For 10 years they've been down there. Let's show them our appreciation and we'll pray for them. Thank you very much. Why don't we all stand together and we'll close in prayer and praying for their work. Father, thank you so much for your servants, Jerry and Pat, and for Justin and Amanda and all those that have committed to this work down here. Lord, for, for a decade, they have uh, given of themselves, of their time, of their money, and, and Lord, of, of being away from family and friends here in the States. We thank you for your humble servants. Lord, we ask that you strengthen them, strengthen their health, and, and protect them, Lord. Lord, it's so refreshing to see all these children and to hear their stories and 
uh, to learn just a little bit about them. Help us as a congregation to commit to praying for them. And Lord, we're excited that uh, through the monies that have been given and the different things that have been done, that they have been taken off the street and, and physically they have food to eat and have uh, shelter to protect them. But Lord, the, the thing that excites us the most is through these efforts and these works that we've charted or, and you have charted a new faith journey Lord, to change the direction of their hearts and, Lord, change the direction of their lives and their souls for all of eternity. Lord, we pray for the up- upcoming contribution that will fund this ministry. Lord, I pray that each one of us can commit to, to praying for these children and praying that our hearts be open and what you'd have us to do. Lord, we know that you will provide for this ministry because it's your project, Lord, and it's your plan. And, Lord, it's being done through your power. Lord, we thank you so much for directing us and guiding us. Lord, we thank you for this morning we've had. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you very much.